welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Maxwell, and I'm a technical support manager here at Computer Aided Technology. Uh, I started doing technical support back in 2010, so I've been uh, uh, in the technical support game for SolidWorks for a while now. So uh, if there's any questions kind of off the wall, usually the, those get to me uh, on, on the team. Uh, if you saw the webinar just that just happened before this, that was from Dan. He's also one of the technical support managers uh, here at C CATI as well. And we've got a team of about 30 people total that are uh, on our phones and chat support and email support. So uh, if you're one of our customers, uh, please use support as, uh, you know, whenever you need, we're, we're here for you. So this presentation here is going to be about a pretty common workflow that uh, I see from time to time. And this actually started as a demo for a company that that did things a little differently than the typical customer when it comes to building an assembly. Uh, so we adapted this into a little bit of a of a webinar, and I've also done this presentation at uh, SolidWorks World, uh, 3D Experience World, and uh, and user group uh, presentations, kind of around the Ohio area where I am. So the the workflow is called concept to manufacturing from multi bodies to assemblies. And what that means is working from the start, which is a, a what we're gonna show is a multi body design, and then working your way efficiently to the point that you're at a working assembly file. And the real big reason that this is even a conversation to have is that a lot of people get stuck early on in their design and they invest a ton of time and a, a, a ton of effort into building something. And then, you know, a couple of days or weeks later, you find out that maybe that project gets uh, gets stopped for whatever reason, right? Maybe the customer is not interested in that design or there's, uh, you know, no financial reasons to pursue it or whatever. There's countless reasons that something can get stopped. But if you've invested a ton of time and and been building this assembly from the ground up that whole time, that's a lot of work that's lost. So what we like to do here is work through some design iterations. And I'm splitting this into three different main phases of creating an assembly. That's gonna start at something called the concept phase. And then we're gonna work our way to the quoting phase and then the manufacturing phase. In this specific uh, webinar here, we're gonna be talking about a food cart. So this is something that uh, is going to stand in some type of commercial kitchen. It's going to help keep food hot or cold, display it so it looks nice, you know, and then uh, protect it in some ability. So we've got like some glass panel on top to, uh, to protect from people's fingers or sneezes or whatever. So the first phase in the design is going to be the concept phase. And that's when you're just going to be trying some things out. There's some third-party applications out there that kind of specialize in the concept phase, right? Like uh, like ways of of sketching and uh, and modeling something with very rudimentary shapes, but we're going to be using SolidWorks for that um, and and no other third-party applications because we don't want to lose any data, right? And and that's part of this whole presentation is not losing any work and not losing any data. So we're going to be working with basic extrudes and sketches in SOLIDWORKS to build up a quick concept. Now, the key to the concept phase is you don't need a lot of details here. You just wanna come up with the general shape or direction that that thing is gonna, gonna go, right? So you don't wanna invest a ton of time, and this is gonna be where you're gonna try to get some basic buy-off from the company, like uh, approval, basically. As you move up the design and you start getting some headway and buy off from the company, then you're going to start adding in more detail. So you're going to take those basic shapes, those basic extrudes, start converting them into more realistic looking pieces and parts. But you're not going to want to include unnecessary details here, right? So we're not going to make it manufacturable. We're going to make it quotable. That's why we call it the quoting phase here. So it's going to be uh, an assembly that looks nice, but only includes the necessary details. So this, the main goal of the quoting phase is to try to show your idea in a way that anyone could understand it. 
right? So it's not just a concept anymore, but now it's a visual design of that uh, assembly. And then finally, we're going to arrive at the manufacturing phase. This is where you take those basic ideas that you've been cultivating through the rest of the design, and you're going to turn them into a real working assembly file. So that's detail views, manufacturable components, uh, purchased components like nuts, bolts, screws, and making things like bill of materials, right, to organize this and actually have it become made right, or manufacturable. So those are the three phases that we're going to focus on, and we're going to get into some tips and tricks along the way to make things uh, beneficial. Now, again, this design is specifically this food cart, but this is going to apply to hundreds of different uh, types of designs, thousands, really. Uh, there's really no limitation to this, right? Starting off with basic uh, concepts and then working your way to the manufacturing phase. That should be what everyone does to an extent, but we've seen so many people get caught up immediately looking at what hardware they're going to use, immediately looking at how things are going to be built, right? When really the first stage should be trying to get what the shape and the look of it should be. One of the most important lessons that I as an engineer ever learned is that you never want to redo or duplicate work, right? Uh, it's kind of a pain. Redoing work is, is, is pretty painful. So like if you made a file, right, you invested some time into making a part, and then a couple weeks later, you can't find it. Maybe it got deleted, or maybe it got filtered away somewhere where you can't find it. And you have to redo that work, rebuild it. That's, that's never fun. But what what's worse than that is actually duplicating work, right? And that's like if you find that part again after you just rebuilt it, now you have two of the exact same parts that you invested hours and hours into, both of them. Maybe one is better than the other, but who knows? Maybe they're the exact same thing. All I want to do is try to limit any of that stuff. No redoing work, no duplicating work, work on efficiency. All right. So we're going to use that concept phase, build on it to get to the quoting phase, and then build on that to get to the manufacturing phase. So all of these are directly connected to each other, uh, and you don't lose any work, you don't lose any time. So let's start with the concept phase. Like I said, there's some cool apps out there that we've seen that kind of specialize in the quoting or in, in the concept phase, um, but we're going to use native default SOLIDWORKS. We don't want to risk losing any data as we go through this process of building this assembly, right? So no converting, no exporting, no importing. Just work in SOLIDWORKS, work in one part file when we're in this concept phase. There's a couple tools that SOLIDWORKS does have that can make this concept phase uh, a little easier. One of those things is pen sketching. So if you have a touch screen laptop or a uh, monitor of some type, pen sketching is a pretty awesome enhancement that's been added into SOLIDWORKS in the last couple of years. I think it's been three years now since it was first added. And as you can see here, there's like a Microsoft Surface tablet. If we have this touch screen mode enabled, we can navigate around an assembly file with our fingers. You can zoom in, you can touch things, you can drag them around, right? So using like a move commands, you can uh, magnifying glass, zoom in on things, make sure you're selecting the right things. And they've made this better every year. Uh, like I said, it's been three or four years. It keeps on improving and making it a little smoother. So as you can see, you can draw shapes using the pen, right? Uh, it connects lines together. It can automatically create shapes if you turn those features on, or it can also automatically create sketch entities like this. So just those basic shapes can get turned into sketch entities. You could build anything you want out of it, right? So just like you're sketching with your with your mouse, you can do with your uh, with your fingers or a, or a pen on the screen. So uh, even some of our team on the tech support team have touchscreen monitors now because uh, a lot more customers are starting to use them, and uh, the stuff can be really, can be really fun, um, especially if you're artistic. I'm not I'm not the I'm not the best at drawing, but uh, some of the <laughs> some things can be pretty cool to see, and some people are really good at it. So it's kind of like uh, mixing art and uh, and CAD design a little bit. So in this specific design, uh, I want to draw out like a quick layout of the kitchen that I'm going to build this food cart in. So by using my touch tools, I can turn on this auto shape. 
and start drawing lines. And even though my handwriting isn't great and my lines are kind of curvy, by having an auto shape turned on, it's going to automatically create them in a straight lines. It doesn't mean up and down vertical or horizontal, but it does mean that it's a straight line. Uh, you can change the thickness or the color. So maybe I want to show that this fridge door is going to open, right, and draw a little line with the red line there. You can also turn off auto shape. So if you want to draw some curvy lines or write things down, maybe I add some shading here to show that that's going to be the countertop. I want to mark this thing as the fridge, this thing as the range. That's just by drawing with auto shape turned off. I'll, t I'll uh, take my blue pen here and draw in the middle, and that's going to represent where that food cart is actually going to exist in the kitchen. So it's just a rectangle um, just drawn in the middle. Now this is just drawing. This is the same thing as markers on paper, right? The only thing that's that makes us a little better than that is, for one, we're in SolidWorks. But for two, we have that auto shape turned on, right? So we can kind of automatically draw straight lines in our... Our uh, penmanship isn't as important. But really, the real feature of drawing in SOLIDWORKS like this is to be able to turn things into sketch entities. So I can go and I can selectively pick which lines I just drew I want to be sketch entities. As I click on them and turn them into sketch entities, you can see they turn into blue sketch lines. It's the same thing as using the line tool in a sketch and drawing lines to make this outline of the kitchen that's going to be in my backdrop, right? Of uh, of my food cart. I can turn this into sketch entities and then use the power trim tool to just trim that up real quick. And I'm left with the rectangle there in the middle. So by far, that's the best part of sketching in SOLIDWORKS and keeping everything in SOLIDWORKS, right? Is you can draw whatever shapes you want and then turn them into sketch entities and trim them, add dimensions to them, add relations to them, whatever it is, right? just like you sketched them normally with the with the line tool or circle tool or whatever else you you're trying to draw all right so pen sketching is pretty amazing um i'm sure there's going to be a ton more improvements there already has been in the last two years uh they're trying to make it kind of a more mainstream i guess you could say and we're we are seeing a lot more companies adapt to it or at least have the capability to so if you have like a Wacom tablet with a big screen or a surface, like one of those surface table looking things, you know, uh, you can you could basically never use a mouse and just use uh, a pen to sketch. Uh, you can even draw like with your with handwriting dimensions and apply them to lines. So just drawing out the numbers can actually uh, uh, apply those as dimension. So it's it's pretty cool to see. All right, so, th so that's a quick way of making like a concept of uh, some shape kind of in the 2D realm, and then, and then you can use that to extrude things. But the next thing I want to show is this kind of uh, one of my favorite tools in SOLIDWORKS called the Magnetic Mates tool. And what we're going to do is actually build a mock-up of kitchen cabinets in this kitchen to show where the food cart's going to sit, right? Because in this concept phase, remember, we're just trying to get the basic basic design. So I'm building a little back backdrop. I'm kind of putting in a little bit more time than I, I might need, but maybe I'm going to be building multiple food carts, right? And I want to show uh, where that food cart is going to look, make it look as impressive as I can, All right? And build that food cart there in the, in the center. So Magnetic Mates came out in like Zolliver's 2017. It's nothing brand new, but it's something that we don't see a lot in technical support. A lot of people don't call us about it. Maybe it's because it's extremely easy to use, or maybe it's because it's underutilized. I usually kind of uh, think that there's a lot of underutilized tools in SOLIDWORKS, and Magnetic Mates is definitely a big one. So what I'm going to do is, as you can see on the right, I've got a design library. And in that design library, I have a folder of IKEA cabinets. This is actually based off my kitchen in my house. <laughs> so I can grab these cabinets, and I can drag them or in this case, the stove. And as you can see, there's all those little purple dots on the outside boundaries of these cabinets. Those purple dots are snap points. So kind of like Legos have the six uh, little circles on the top, right, to snap them to other Legos. That's where we're doing these little purple dots. So you just kind of drag it so it's close and then let go and it snaps to the other corresponding purple dot. As you can see, I can also change configurations of things. So I can hit access this drop down change that to a different type of configuration. 
and then drag and drop more. Maybe that middle one there is actually supposed to be uh, shorter, so a microwave would go under it. So I can switch that to that type of configuration, update it. And then as you can see, I can just drag it up to the top there instead. So I can change which purple dot I'm trying to lock together, but it only does one at a time. Right. So the other thing it does over on this other side is you can see it actually modifies the orientation. So it's going to automatically do that. All you need is a floor boundary and those purple dots built into parts. And then you can build things like Legos. Very easy to just kind of drag it around, find where it can lock up to another purple dot and then let go. I always think of this as kind of uh, like playing roller coaster tycoon. Right, you uh, <laughs> you throw in a track, and then you grab the next track, and it locks on to the to the one you built before. So a very popular um, like example of this would be like conveyor belt assemblies on like a uh, a factory floor. Right, you're gonna you're gonna have multiple different pieces of that. That some are gonna ramp, some are gonna have dish offs to the other sides, some are gonna have tools connected to them. Each one you drag one by one, and you snap it to the last one. Um, so this is something that it's been around in in like 2D software for a while, but not a lot of 3D softwares have it. SolidWorks is one of the one of the first to get that kind of snapping um, technology, I guess you can call it, uh, in their assemblies. So let's get to the real meat of the uh, concept phase, and that's going to be some basic modeling to build this food cart. Finally, right? That's going to sit in the center of this kitchen. This is going to be with really basic SOLIDWORKS uh, features, like extrudes. Uh, we are going to throw a weldment feature in there, but very, very basic. Um, and really, you don't have to be a CAD modeling professional to be able to do concept phase design. Um, we've proposed to countless companies that people even outside of the engineering group could do conceptual design. All you have to do is teach them like a few very, very simple commands, right? Sketching and extruding, basically. As long as you know how to, you know, insert some planes and sketch on them, you don't have to be a pro to build something like this here. Excuse me. So I'm not going to bore you with drawing up really simple blocks, but rolling down through this feature tree, you can see how we'd go about laying the food cart out, right? So these are all just basic extrude features and extrude cut features. And this is going to be a multi-body design. I know I mentioned that in the beginning, but really it's better as a matter of fact to be in a multi-body here as you can see i can fire up the structural member tool up at the top which is going to start a weldment feature so these are all extrudes and now i'm going to add uh, a weldment feature now if you think of what a weldment is typically it's like structural steel right welded together that's the intent of the weldment tool but it can be used for a ton of different things um, i use it for lumber uh, in this case, I'm going to use it for glass. As you can see, I've got this standard called glass. And what we're actually going to do is build the sneeze guard up at the top of this food cart by using this glass weldment profile. What a weldment is, is actually just a sweep, right? It's a profile sketched out that sweeps along some type of path. So by clicking glass here, I can say I want to use my sneeze guard profile and I want it to be 10 by 10 and then I can click on the path that I want that sneeze guard to sweep about. The nice thing about the weldment feature is you automatically miter at your corners. The other cool thing is I can add a gap here, right? Like a weld gap. What that'll give me is the ability to build like a metal frame on this in the future that would connect all these pieces of glass together. So that's something that uh, will be really hard to do, but the weldment feature makes it super, super easy to do, right? So just taking that glass profile, sweeping it along the top using the weldment tool will automatically create this. Now, the coolest thing about this is if I ever need to make a change, right? Like maybe I need to change it to a different length or different angle, I can just change my profile. The weldment tool is designed for that. You can always go back to the beginning, change the profile, and then it changes the design. And just like that, we've got our concept phase. So super, super easy. That was just extrudes and one weldment feature. So just a bunch of extruded blocks and a weldment feature. Now the pan in the middle, that was just a dragged in part file. Uh, in the feature tree there, it's called salad, uh, 
think it's called salad bar. Oh no, salad bar roof is the the thing on top. So that's just a dragged in feature, right? To uh, to be the uh, the bin that the tray that the food would go into. Now the nicest thing about doing this in a multi body part environment is that we don't have all those countless files, right? We don't have 50 files on our hard drive sitting right now that are all linked together. There's no in-context relationships, right? And any changes to dimensions or even complete changes to the whole design would be really easy right now. It's just a bunch of sketches of rectangles and extrude lengths is all we have. So everything can be changed with just simple dimensional changes at this point. So that makes it very, very easy down the road when everything else is linked to this. That's the concept phase. All the basic modeling is uh, is done. Another thing to think about right now is, as you can see with the backdrop of the kitchen, right, kind of make it look a little nice. This might be time to throw in some renders, maybe use SOLIDWORKS Visualize, create some photorealistic renders of models um, or, or something like that, right? But again, the concept phase is to get that idea out there. So show it to your boss, show it to the other people that are on the design team, right get those ideas out there and really with something designed with just one part file like this you could even email it right it's it's super small this file is probably a couple megabytes in size that you could send to anybody that has solidworks so the next phase is going to be the quoting phase and the key thing to notice when we're working in the quoting phase is that we're going to directly leverage all of that work that we just did in the concept phase. So nothing's going to be wasted. And there's a couple cool techniques that we can use to, to leverage that, that data. One really cool trick that I like to show is a technique called sacrificing bodies. What this is used for a lot is for something like, uh, like weldments, right? So say you need to create this kind of complicated weldment of pieces and parts that connect at weird angles. That body there on the left could be pretty easily built, right? That's just a extrude with maybe some chamfers, right, to build that part. Pretty easy. But if we take that body and then we do a 3D sketch and select all the edges, we could then convert those edges into its own 3D sketch and then build a structural member off of that 3D sketch. So Again, a very simple body could be used to create a very complicated structural member feature. So this is by sacrificing that body. So that's a pretty cool tool. Uh, again, that's just creating your feature, starting a 3D sketch, using convert entities to grab all the edges, and then creating the structural member on those converted entities in a new 3D sketch. And this can be used in uh, hundreds of different ways as well. Uh, a story, a personal story that I have is my cousin actually built a garage and we used this exact same technique to build the garage out. So we built a really primitive design of what he wanted the garage to look like with just extrudes, right? That's a pretty simple model, just extrudes and it's hollowed out. And then we converted all of the edges from that and then just use some sketch patterns and some other sketch tools to fill in where we wanted our beams and uh, and all the lumber. And then we were able to use structural member with lumber profiles to actually build out the entire garage. The funny part about this too, is that we actually went through the three design phases, right? That we're going over right now, where first we created a concept and then we got to the quoting phase and uh, had to get approval right from not only my cousin's wife but then the city and uh they ended up nixing it because uh, you couldn't have that second story without a special <laughs> a special permit so uh we ended up having a not full second story like it like it's shown here but it was close it was almost it was almost there so luckily we didn't invest too much time in it in the in the beginning <laughs> by using our our uh, technique another cool little tool to talk about is uh SOLIDWORKS has a lot of unique features, right? And specific features that are used in different uh, types of manufacturing. But one thing they don't have is a really good solution for panel design. So the best solution that I've found 
uh, for making panel design, like uh, you know, like if you're putting laminate or paneling on the outside of a body, is to use the convert to sheet metal tool. So again, that's a tool that's typically used to make sheet metal parts, but you could use it to create panel pieces. Um, so as you can see, we could take that, we can convert different faces to sheet metal bodies, we could trim them manually, and then you're left with a with a basic panel design. So say if you were building cabinets or something like that, uh, in this case, we're going to build the outside of the food cart using a technique like this. And this is using convert to sheet metal to uh, remove the body and instead replace it with with uh, panel pieces. All right. So kind of like when I was talking about the weldment tool, that doesn't have to be structural member, right? It could be glass. And with convert to sheet metal, you don't have to be building chunks of sheet metal. You could be building pieces of wood, right? So a feature could be used for a ton of different industries. It's just called something because that's what it was specifically made for to begin with. The idea that we're doing all this with multi bodies, it might be kind of tricky for some people to, to catch on to, right? Instead of building this assembly, we're starting off with this one body, or I'm sorry, one part file built with multiple bodies. But as you can see in a chart like this, and this might be a good page to like screenshot, is that multi bodies and assemblies since the year 2003 have been getting closer and closer to the same thing every year. So you used to not be able to do patterns in a multi-body part. Now you can pattern bodies. That was all the way back in 2003. And then if you all go all the way to like 2018 to 2019, we even can do tab and slots in multi-body environments. We can do interference detection. We can do uh, linked properties to different bodies instead of part files. And in reality, the bottom two, it's actually a benefit to be a multi-body. So for one, you're a single file, right? You're not a ton of different files linked together, and you don't have any external references unless you purposely do, right? But by default, there's no external references in a multi-body part. So that's actually better and uh, might save some time. So if you're ever in the situation of deciding, man, do I really need to turn this into an assembly right now or can I keep it as a, can I keep it as a uh, multi-body part? The only reason that you need to turn it into an assembly is if you real you really need motion, right? If you actually need to see that dynamic motion, so you need to use collision detection or any type of dynamic clearance um, or using physical dynamics and simulation, then you have to be an assembly. Other than that, I would say keep it as a multi-body part as long as you can it would be my personal recommendation. All right, so the quoting phase. We're gonna take that part that we built and we're gonna turn it into a little bit more detailed of a part. The first thing we're gonna do is converting uh, the, the boundaries, the outside walls of this into some framing, all right? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna isolate some specific bodies. So I'm gonna click these three bodies and I'm gonna isolate them. That shows me just those bodies and hides everything else. Then I'm just going to create a really simple 3D sketch. So I've started a 3D sketch, and I'm going to convert some entities. Those entities I'm going to use to create the frame that I'm going to build some structural members out of. When you do convert entities, you can always drag the ends of your lines, right? So those vertical lines, I just dragged them to lock to the top uh, rectangle. So basically, basically now I have one 3D sketch that has that top rectangle and then four edge lines going down um, from the top down there. The next thing I'm going to do is start a 2D sketch over here on the side panel. I'm going to sketch a center line up the middle and then I'm going to turn on dynamic mirror entities. What that does is it allows you to mirror as you go. So as I'm drawing this, uh, this shape here from left to right, it's also mirroring on the other side to create this uh, accordion looking sketch. As you can see, I can drag and drop these, or I can add this one dimension here. And I'll say I want that accordion to stop one and a half inches from the bottom. All right, so that's pretty cool. That's gonna be that design of the frame that goes down the side of this. And 
And again, these yellow bodies here, we're sacrificing them. We're not going to have them in the end. Excuse me. We're not going to have them in the end. Uh, we're going to have just the sketch lines that we have here converted to weldment bodies. So everything here is directly related to that geometry. If you noticed, all I was doing was converting entities and sketching while hitting the edges. The only thing I added was one dimension so far. So remember that just one dimension has been added so far. All right, so now, there's a, now is the time to use the structural member feature, which again, sweeps a profile along these different paths that were just sketched out or converted. I'm going to pick on the ANSI standard and then the square tube profile. And in this case, it's just going to be a one inch square tube. I'm going to click on these four entities and then create another group at the top to create the top edge of this as well. I'm then going to locate the profile. So I'm locating it to the outside boundaries uh, of the body that I built so far. Right, because I want this thing to exist down inside it, not up and around it. This is by using that locate profile button. Now, to build the accordion, I need to uh, create two different groups. As you create groups, um, the trim order actually follows that order of groups. Right, so I've created that first group of left to right, and then the second one from right to left. And as you can see, it trims it in the order here shown. So you can see that first one takes priority over the second group. I want to change that. So to do that, I can just click on this little purple dot here and change the trim order of that specific area, right? So if I want group two to trim for group one or vice versa, I can change that here by changing the trim order of that specific spot. A lot of people don't realize that when they're building uh, weldments and they build it in like 18 different groups, right, to, to be able to control the trim order. But really, you can just click on any trim and change the order of that very specific section. Once that's done, right, I, I'll hit my green check here. And then I'll just mirror those over to the other side. Then all I have to do is hide the original extruded bodies do that I can just hit tab right with my mouse so let's uh, let's mirror this over perfect and then I'll just hit tab on those three bodies to be left with the frame right so now we've replaced that rudimentary shape of those three panels with this nice representation of metal uh, tubing that's going to be that's going to be used instead so again we're going from very basic to a little bit more detailed. And, and we also built all that stuff with just one dimension. It was a 1.5 dimension from the bottom to, uh, to show where the accordion shape starts. That's the only dimension we added so far. So that's, uh, that's pretty awesome. All right, so that was using the weldment tool to build the framing. Now let's use some sheet metal tools to build the, the tray that's going to go along the top the the area where the food's going to be on the food cart. So again, we're going to isolate and I'm going to isolate this body here to be one of the trays. And we're going to do some prep work, which is going to be sketching here uh, by offsetting the edges of the bottom of this. The reason I'm offsetting this is because I'm going to split the face to here at the bottom by using the split line tool. The split line tool is used in a ton of different features. Um, it's really most popular in simulation if you want to isolate a specific area of a face. But in this case, I'm going to use it when I use my convert to sheet metal because I'm going to use it as the stopping edge of my converted face, right? So if you picture that whole blue face right here, if I converted that to sheet metal, it'd be one big plate of sheet metal. But if I split this into two uh, faces, right? One would be the inner boundary and the other being the outer boundary. I could specify that just one of those wants to be converted to sheet metal and the other can be ignored. And that's what we're going to do. All right. So I'll use my split line tool. I'll split that face. Perfect. So now you can see I have two different faces. 
I'm going to sketch on this face here, and I'm going to draw these two little lines to represent the miters of where my edge flanges are going to exist. And then all I have to do is split that face with those two miter sketches I just created. And now we have those three faces at the bottom. Now I'm just going to click on the Convert to Sheet Metal tool and click on the faces that I want to exist as sheet metal. So that top face there, and then I click on the three faces or the four faces that I want to be bent edges. And then at the bottom, I'm going to click on the three edges that I want to bend. Automatically, it found those other sketch lines as ripped edges. The, the, the miter edges that we created, those are going to automatically be considered as rips. And now that whole body is now converted to sheet metal. So it's like the skin of what that was. And again, those bottom faces are only to where I split it. So that's a really, really easy way to build some cool uh, edge flange looking features is just splitting the faces and then using the convert to sheet metal. Again, this is a sheet metal part, so I could flatten it whenever I want. I could have hundreds of sheet metal parts in the same part file, all with different uh, thicknesses, all with different shapes. It doesn't matter. Uh, I could isolate any one of them and get the flat pattern of it. I don't have to turn that into an assembly in the long run if I don't want to. So this, again, is built directly off of the primitive shapes that were built in the concept phase, right? Full weldment features, full sheet metal features, uh, all built right on top of or replacing, right, the bodies that we built in that concept phase. Again, that, that sheet metal part had no dimensions. So we're not adding a lot more information, but we are adding more detail. So it's a... It's a nice process to use. All the other sheet metal parts would be done in, in a similar manner, right? So using the Convert to Sheet Metal tool. Oops. I hit the wrong arrow button. Sorry about that. So again, uh, that'll be used to create as many sheet metal bodies within that single part file as you want. Pretty awesome. Now down here, we're going to use a really similar tool um, to create the panels that are going to go at the bottom. So again, as I mentioned, SolidWorks hasn't released a real true panel designer tool yet. It could happen. Um, but right now, we, we're going to use the Convert to Sheet Metal to get around that and use it a little bit differently. So these are going to build panels and laminate covers for the base of the cart. Right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use the Convert to Sheet Metal tool again. But this time, there's this little option that we can turn on called Keep Body right here. What that does is it allows us to convert this body to sheet metal face by face while keeping the rest of the body still intact. So that allows us to isolate just single faces at a time or a couple faces at a time, whatever we want. In a panel design, it's going to be single faces, right? Because we're replacing one face with one chunk of wood right? without deleting the source body. So really, we only have to uncheck keep body on the last one that we do to get rid of that basic shape that we created. So I'm going to check on the keep body check. And then I'm going to click on that face and then green check. That's going to turn it into a piece of wood, right? Or a thick, a thick sheet metal body is honestly what it's doing. I'll do the same thing on the back here. And if you've got a really good eye, you'll notice that these parts are actually overlapping as I do it. That's again because we don't have a true panel design tool, right? These bodies are just merged together in the corners. So we're going to have to get a little creative here because we don't have that panel design feature. The best tool that I've found to, uh, to compensate of those overlapping parts is by using the indent feature. Again, this is one of those like underutilized tools, but I can turn on this feature cut. And what it actually does, it'll use one body to cut another body. So it's kind of like an intersection tool that allows you to cut multiple bodies with, uh, with other bodies. So if you've never used this before, um, you're probably not alone. It's definitely an, another one of those underutilized features in SolidWorks. Uh, it's very nice in the multi-body environment, and you can actually use this in assembly environments as well. So uh, something pretty nice. So I'm going to turn on the cut feature here, and I'm going to click on the uh, sidewall here, and that's going to be the target body. And then I'm going to click on the bottom, and it's going to cut away using that bottom one. 
So as you can see, uh, edges pop up there where it's actually creating the cut. And now those, those are not overlapping. Now on the back, I'm gonna create, select the whole back body as the uh, target body, and then the sides and the bottom as the tool. And that uses those sides and bottoms to cut away the back, so the back fits into it like a puzzle piece. So it doesn't even have to be as simple as rectangles, right? It could be any shape to use this type of feature. Um, but now they're all butted up against each other instead of overlapping. So that's pretty easy. Uh, it's just something that uh, you know you might not think of right away because it's, again, a tool that's not used very often. Right? So if you have overlapping parts like that, the indent tool is usually the best way to, to compensate for that. So the issue now is that we want to build this laminate on the outside of that part, but I drew this thing to exactly 36 inches, and that's the sh that's the width I want it to be. I don't want it to be 36 and a quarter. So if I add eighth inch paneling on the outside, it's going to kind of mess up, right? So the thickness is going to put us over that dimension, uh, the thickness of the laminate in this case. It's not what I want. So let's roll back to when we first extruded the shape of the base. And again, we're going to use one of those uh, hidden features. This time, it's going to be the move face command. So I could use the I could do the math, right? And I could say, well, it's an inch inch laminate. I'm going to move, or I'm going to make it a quarter inch smaller in this case because I have two laminate bodies on either side. But what I could do is instead just use my move face command, and I'm going to offset the outside faces to account for the thickness of the laminate. I don't have to do as much math, and it uh, it makes it simpler. So I'm going to click on my Move Face tool. I'm going to type in the thickness of my laminate, which is going to be 0.1 inches in this case. Right? We're going to go simple. And then I'm going to flip my direction to go inwards instead of out. And then it's going to actually move those faces in by that uh, by that dimension. So that moves the faces in. Um, it leaves the body a little bit thinner, right? But our dimension still says 36. So it's a way to kind of compensate for that. Then what we can do is use our convert to sheet metal again. And this time we're going to do the thickness on the outside of the body instead of the inside. So I'm going to click on this uh, reverse thickness button. That flips the paneling to the outside to represent our laminate. So I'll do that on uh, on all the outside faces again by doing convert to sheet metal, clicking on the three outside faces. That's again kind of building these big sheet metal bodies, but this time they're only 0.1 inches thick. And then now if we go down to where after we created the panels, we now have these nice panels with the laminate on the outside of them. And we're still matching our 36 inch dimension from the beginning. So a quick way of kind of tackling a little problem there along the way, right, of adding the, the paneling and keeping the size the same. So what we did was we did convert to sheet metal twice on the same faces, right, to build those, uh, those uh, laminate pieces and the paneling pieces. All right, so now I'm going to exit my isolate. And now we've got a multi-body part that has some weldments has some panels, and it has a much better idea of where we're going in our design. We can start getting a basic cut list made up of some of the sheet metal parts, um, some of the weldment parts, maybe start getting some, some quotes created for certain pieces and parts of the design. And again, that will uh, we'll finish off our quoting phase. All right, so we have a, we have a pretty clean multi-body part made with uh, some sheet metal features, some weldment bodies. Um, and again, like I said, we could create a cut list to see how many bodies we've created so far, the lengths of all those weldments, or any other details like that. Now we can move on to the manufacturing phase. Um, and this is where we're going to complete the project. We're going to add all the detail necessary for fabrication and making the assembly, right? So we can show some uh, some cool features here. I'm going to use some automated tools in SOLIDWORKS that actually uh, could be repeated in other assemblies that maybe share the same components. 
The first tool I'm going to show is the tab and slot tool. The tab and slot can be used in multi-body environments as well as assemblies. And what this is actually going to do is add those tabs and slots to our panels. So we're going to kind of dummy proof the assembly process of this, right? Make sure it can only fit in one way and make sure the manufacturing people can build it as easily as they can. And we'll see if it can be even built, right, while we're doing this type of process. So these are things that you tackle during that manufacturing phase. So I'm going to isolate the wooden panels at the bottom here, and I'm going to use, again, a tool that's traditionally used for sheet metal, but it can also be used for wood, tab and slot. Right? And again, this is going to make it so it's easier to, to assemble. To do this, all we have to do is select the edges where we want to run the tabs and the slots. It's going to realize that those uh, different bodies interact with each other, and we're going to tell it uh, these different variables to define what we want our tabs and slots to look like. So things like our tab length, how many tabs do we want? Do we want them equally spaced or do we want some type of offset on certain edges, right? And where do we want the tabs and slots to stop? So we can do this with all these different variables in the, uh, in the tool. So this can be used to create a ton of different tabs, right? Or it can just be used to create a couple, just based on these variables. Um, the slots are then automatically created to correspond with the tabs that we built. So as you can see here, we've got the tabs and the slots just like that, right? firing up that simple command. We could edit that. We could add chamfers, maybe make it even easier to align when it's getting dropped in there. Um, and again, this can be used in both multi-body part files that overlap like this, or it can be used in assemblies. So uh, you don't have to do this in this environment. You can use it, you could do it in the traditional assembly uh, assembly environment as well. Oops. Sorry, I skipped forward a little bit. Perfect. Okay, so once we have the tab and slots set the way that we want them on the one edge, we can actually use the same settings on other edges and just redefine the specific selections of what edge you want it to be. So that's pretty cool. So that you can do that on the whole bottom of the of the part there. <laughs> so if we take a look at the cut list here, we can see that every piece is an individual um, item, right? And that has quantities, it has lengths and angles and all these different parameters. Uh, length, cut angle, description, material, all that stuff. Any custom properties could also be added here, like part numbers, uh, project name, uh, and anything else like that. Here, what we're gonna do is just select those bodies and we're gonna apply a different material to them, right? So now you can see that those are gonna be made out of 6061 alloy and Again, we can have a, a more manufacturable part now that we know what it's made out of when we send it to uh, when we send it to either a drawing or if you're using like MVD, it'll have that material automatically applied. This, of course, could be done for all those wooden parts as well, right? It doesn't have to just be the sheet metal parts. Um, so I'm going to click on the wooden bodies of this assembly, and I'm going to make these. Uh, be made out of maple in this case is the, the material that I, I'm going to select here. So go to material and I've got maple here in my quick selection. You'll notice it actually also uh, colors the parts as we go as well. All right. So with the sheet metal part, you'll notice we actually have even more information than the weldments and the other bodies. We've got all the cutting lengths for uh, if this thing was going to be laser cut. We have bend numbers. We have uh, the bounding box, we've got the bend radius information. There's a ton of stuff that comes automatically for sheet metal parts. So the last thing that we'll have to do here is find all those sheet metal parts and apply the material for those as well. So I've got a material here and we'll apply this uh, stainless steel material to them for the for the trays on the outside of this. All right. So again, this is all done in one part file. We can change material of things, we can change uh, properties, we can apply custom properties to them, we can name them, um, there's countless things we can do. Again, showing that multi-bodies and assemblies are closer than they've ever been.
So now for the ultimate test. Let's roll back all the way back to the concept phase here, as you can see in my feature tree, and let's change some dimensions. So I'm going to change this, uh, the height and the width here. Right now they're they're not named, so let's name them first so we don't get too confused. And then I'm going to start instant 3D dragging them to different sizes. Right, so let's stretch this thing to 53 inches wide. Let's make it 34 inches deep. And let's uh, make it taller as well. We'll drag that height up to 34 inches, right? So now we've got a, a big one and we'll drag our feature tree down to the bottom and all that stuff automatically rebuilds. Nothing's broken, no warning messages, no nothing. All of the properties update, right? So now we have different uh, bounding box length and width, different um, cutting lengths, right? Based on that new sheet metal size and all of that stuff automatically changes by just going back to that first model and dragging some things around. So a whole assembly can all reflect that one part file that we made in the beginning. Pretty cool. So when we're ready, we can actually convert this thing into, assemb an, into an assembly file. To do that, we're just going to go up to our cut list. We're going to right click on it and say save bodies. What this will actually do is save out all the individual bodies out as part files. So this is when you're going to go from the multi body environment to the assembly environment. With this command, we get the option to create a full assembly that contains all of those part files. Um, and like I was saying before, a lot of people might think that this might even conclude that this isn't even a necessary part, right? Maybe you don't have to get to an assembly. Uh, detailed drawings can be made for each body without having to do this. Um, you could get DXF files out of your sheet metal parts for each body. Um, but, I mean, there are, there are some benefits to doing an assembly as well. So some people might decide to do this step even earlier in the process, right? So it just depends on your certain situation. So really, the story is it's up to you when you want to go from the part environment to the assembly environment. Keep in mind, though, that everything is still going to propagate to all the part files whenever we come back to this master multi-body part file and make any changes to it. Those all still get reflected in the assembly. So it's not like we do this now and, and we're, we're lost. In some cases, some things might not reflect perfectly because there might be some mates and things that get broken but everything's still going to reflect this original file. So that's uh, pretty important to remember. So what about purchase components, right? Maybe we have a little screen that's going to go on the front of this, uh, or maybe we have some casters on the bottom. We've got a bunch of different components that we can add to an assembly like this. <laughs> So as you can see in this assembly, I've got some casters on the bottom. I'm going to open up my PDM window and I browse to where that caster file exists. And we're going to click on, actually, let's do this screen here. We're going to click on the screen in my PDM window. And as you can see, I can navigate it. I can look at it in eDrawings in PDM. And I can just drag it into my SOLIDWORKS assembly. Now, the cool thing about this is I have a smart feature locked into this part file. If you've never used a smart feature before, what that is is actually a feature that has that's linked to the part file. So in this case, we have the screen with some type of housing. It's going to fit into a perfect cutout. So we have the cutout as a feature linked to the part. By clicking on this little lightning bolt that pops up, it's actually going to insert the feature that's linked to it. So it's going to ask me where my face is that it corresponds with where I created it. And that's this face here, the front face of my cart. Now, as you can see, if I drag this around, you'll see there's this cutout that exists that did not exist there before. As I move it, the assembly is going to rebuild and, and move it exactly to where my part is. So that feature is locked to the location of my part. So I'll just add some mates to define where I want this to be. Maybe I'll do a width mate here to center it uh, vertically. And then that uh, feature is now centered and locked on to where the part file is. Pretty cool. The last thing we're going to talk about is smart hardware. So this is uh, 
other components that can also be with your uh, smart part itself. So we're going to go down to the caster here at the bottom of our assembly. And again, I'm going to navigate in PDM to find the, uh, the caster file that I used. As you can see, there's a DWG file of it here. And then here's the SLD PRT, the SOLIDWORKS file. So there's my caster. And I'm going to click and I'm going to drag it into my SOLIDWORKS uh, assembly file. So just dragging it right here. You can see that there's a quick mate already assigned. So whatever a face I lock it to, it mates it to it. And then again, I've got that little lightning bolt that pops up. This time it's going to ask me a couple more uh, pieces of information. Where's the bottom face and where's the top face of where the screws exist. And as you can see, now I have these bolts and nuts and washers all come in with the caster. If I hide these, you can see there's the holes that the screws go through, as well as the screws itself with a little washer and a nut on the bottom. Again, I'm going to mate this thing in, so I'll locate it to where I want the caster to actually exist, maybe two inches from the front face. And then I'll add another distance mate here of three inches from the side face. All of those parts, those pieces and parts move with it. So the caster is the controlling part. Everything else moves alongside it. All right, and that's the smart hardware and smart parts that can be added at the assembly phase. So those things can only be done in the assembly, and that's why we converted to an assembly first. So there's obviously some uh, some steps that were glossed over there, right? To get from the the end of the multi-body part to the finished assembly, we converted a couple more things to sheet metal, um, and then added the the pieces and parts at the top as well that we kind of glossed over here for time's sake. But then that is our uh, assembly file. And then that's the finish of our manufacturing phase. So that will be the, uh, the end of this webinar. Uh, if there's any questions, thanks everybody for joining. I appreciate it.